Hi there guys, well I'm here this evening with Paul Mitchell and I would just like to start by thanking him again for coming in and giving us his time. Thanks Ab very much Paul. Absolute pleasure. Okay Paul, so we're just going to start with a little bit from your earlier career. So let's just start with a wee bit general discussion. And uh, you started working with the BBC in 1991 when you were just 23. How did that come about? I entered the BBC Radio 2 Amateur Sports Commentator of the Year competition. Okay. I entered it twice. Made the Scottish final twice, but I suspect there was only eight guys entered anyway, and we all got into the final. And we had to go through to Glasgow to the old BBC studios, and you were given a clip to commentate on, and then you were judged. Uh, one of the judges one year was Alistair Alexander, and one of the judges, bizarrely, was Derek Ray, right. um, just before he left to go to America. Uh, I didn't win it on either occasion, uh, but I made a contact... Uh, I got a tape sent to BBC Scotland and it just happened they were looking for somebody to cover mainly Edinburgh. Um, so they gave me a chance. A long time alongside Jim Spence was also starting out at the same time. Um, so Spence and I were taken to grounds with other reporters and you'd watch the game, you'd watch them and then you'd get to do a report at the end and eventually they let me loose. Uh, September 91, uh, Hibbs Morton. It was Falkirk at Easter Road. So what are your memories from that game? I was terrified. You know, one week you're, you're with an experienced pro and the next you're plugging in this little box and suddenly, you know, you're on probably the biggest radio programme in the country. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you've got to go and you slot in with everybody else. So, you know, Jim Spence, Bill Moulds, Alistair Alexander, David Begg, Bob Crampsey, all guys that I'd been listening to for ages and all of a sudden... I was part of that, it was very strange. Did you feel, because obviously now you've at a stage where you'll have your own sort of relaxed style when you're when you're commentating on games, did you feel in those earlier sort of weeks and months where you were maybe picking up stuff from guys that you'd aspire to be when you were younger, or was there anything coming into your commentating where you're thinking, well, where have I heard that before? And I'd listened to radio for a long, long time. You're talking underneath the bed covers when I was supposed to be asleep. Yeah. You know, listening to usually Radio Scotland's coverage of the far-flung foreign games. Um, and I just was always intrigued by it. So, you like to see your David Francis at the time was, was the main guy. I, I wasn't sure I was aware of having any one particular style. I just wanted to try and be as clear as I could get the information across. One of the things I learned fairly early was you're better to be short, sharp, concise, rather than warble on for ages, because people get bored. Yeah. Okay. And uh, your commentary career started on radio. Was that a result of preference or circumstance? That tends to be the way it starts. I mean, it was circumstance. I was a reporter for seven years. And basically, BBC Scotland, there was a whole lot of teams in Europe. They were a commentator short just the way the games worked out and so they decided to give me a chance and I got shipped over to Iceland to cover KR Reykjavik against Kilmarnock and that was my first commentary game. Uh, they must have liked what they heard because I got the return leg and then was just slowly introduced. David Begg and Alistair Alexander were the main guys, they still did all the big games but slowly but surely I got a little bit more. Then when television started to come more into it in terms of Scottish football fixtures were then being moved therefore more radio commentators were needed so I was getting a little bit more so that's how I started uh, in a tiny little stadium in Iceland. Did you feel that do you feel that you've maybe benefited from timing in terms of when you got into it and you know things were starting to accelerate in terms of you know how the game was covered on TV and on the radio and there's now you know more coverage than maybe there ever has been do you feel that you know, just as you were starting, was that a good time to get involved? Or? I think you make your own luck. And I think anybody even starting now would find... I mean, when I started, as I've mentioned, television came in and started broadening the games out. But there was no such thing as club media when I started. So, you know, you've got all the guys who are working for clubs now. These jobs didn't exist. So there's always new opportunities coming. Uh, is there a significant difference in the discipline of commentating for radio compared to TV? There is, and a lot of people who do both don't realise that. Um, it's one of these things, radio, you are the picture. It sounds obvious, but you are the picture. You can describe everything from the colour of strips, the weather, the crowd, the stands, you know, anything that's catching your eye, but you've got to keep your eyes on the action. It's amazing, if you listen to radio guys, you should know where the ball is, 
which sounds so obvious, but if you, if you listen across various stations, a number of people have no idea where the ball is, and all of a sudden something happens, and you've got to give the score lots and lots and lots of times. Not the same way, you know, you can say you're still waiting for the breakthrough here, or Hibs looking to get back on level terms. You can give a hint. You don't have to keep saying the score line itself. Yeah, so in, in many ways it might be a case of not, you know, giving across too much of your own opinion. Is that, is that a habit that some people take into radio commentating without realising that they're really there to give the blow by blow county where exactly the ball is on the park and they get maybe too much attached to, you know, oh well this is what I think, yeah. this is what I think, or giving out even, you know, information about a certain player that maybe means that they're going to lose out on, you know, describing exactly what's happening. You've got to make it a flow. So you've got to be able to, if you're going to use a stat on a player, you know, you're not going to do it in the act of shooting, you're going to do it when he's got the ball on the halfway line. If there's an injury, that's a chance. As the commentator, you're there to describe, 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 and use your co-commentator and bring them in at the right times, ask them the right questions, and they can then give your opinions. Don't get me wrong, I've got an opinion, and if the circumstances dictate and time allows, I'll give my opinion. One of the things, it was Bob Crampsy that used to say, go with your first reaction on a penalty, you're usually right. And then one of the guys at TV told me later, he says, if you've got an opinion and your co-com is the former pro, don't be afraid to disagree with them because it helps bring out, you know, disagreement can help bring out different points and why you might see things slightly differently. So I'll never be afraid to give an opinion, just sometimes you really don't have time. If people are getting into their car, for example, and switch on the game, they want to know where the ball is, they want to know what the score is. That's the thing, you know, if you're away, you know, rambling on about stuff, they're, they're not too thrilled. Is there an obvious path of progression laid out for commentators at the BBC, or is it completely dependent on the individual? I don't think there's a path. I don't think there's a path exists anywhere. I think usually there's a need somewhere and that need gets filmed. That's usually how it happens. I was asked to do some television back in 2001 for the highlights for the Scottish Cup programme uh, because they needed somebody and I was given the chance to do that. Then the BBC got the contract for the live football. So Rob McLean, who was the main commentator at the time, then did the live games and I would do the second game so, you know, a chance opened up. BBC, of course, lost the live contract. Rob went to Satanta, and then I got the main gig. Sometimes you're just waiting behind someone yeah. and you just hope that something's going to happen, open up somewhere, and that you're in the right place at the right time. There's, there's no science to it, unfortunately. <laughs> That's right. And uh, is there competition amongst commentators to establish yourself at number one? Or... I mean, is there such a thing as a distinct pecking order within places like the BBC, do you feel? Oh, there is, without doubt. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. I'd rather not talk about Scotland, I'll talk about England. You know, the match of the day thing, there's a pecking order yeah. down there. You know, it was John Watson, it was Barry Davis. Then you saw a jostle underneath with Steve Wilson, Guy Mowbray, Jonathan Pearce. Barry Davis left, who I thought was better than John Watson. Watson then you know, got moved down. But I just presumed Jonathan Pierce would get it, no Guy Mowbray got it. That caused some ructions, which you would have seen in the papers. Yeah. So yeah, I mean there's there's great competition. Uh, but you're reliant on other people. I think one of the things you've got to try and remember, and it's one of the hardest things, Scott, is you've no control over it. If somebody prefers somebody else, you can't do anything. It's a bit like a football manager, you've got, you know, three guys who can play the same position, but you can only play one. The guy will play who he thinks is best. Not saying he's right, but that's his opinion. So there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you've spent your entire broadcast career at the BBC during a period where, with the rise in Sky and now BT Sport, they've infrequently, uh, you know, been the main broadcaster for the SPL. Is that a frustration? It is on a certain extent. Um, I mean, Sky have gone down the route of going with an English guy to commentate on Scottish football, that's their call. I've, Scots guy have commentated on English football, but they had their, you know, their decision, so that's what they've gone with. You've just got to live with what other, other broadcasters want. Um, would I like to have the chance to do more live football? Yeah, I certainly would. But I'm very happy doing what I'm doing at the BBC. I got to do the live stuff for six years and absolutely loved it. My biggest thing is probably less that I'm not so much involved it's the fact that organisations like BBC 
and STV are being priced out, the live football market as more and more goes to satellite and pay TV. That probably concerns me more. I've always said that live Scotland internationals away from home should be on free-to-air television. I don't care whether that's BBC or STV. As a fan, you can't go to the games pretty much, so you should be able to see your national team on a free station. I don't think these kind of games should be stuck away on pay TV. Fair enough. I probably agree with you there. <laughs> Was there ever a temptation to leave the BBC? I have to say no, because the right opportunities never come up. Um, Rob McLean left to go to Satanta. You know, a few years ago, he obviously saw that. You know, as, as a way forward as the BBC lost rights. You never say never because you never know what you're going to be asked, but I've always been very happy to work for the BBC, very proud to work for the BBC. They've got a long, proud history. And as I say, I'm probably a little bit more disappointed they are being priced out the market and that people aren't getting to see football on the BBC, which I believe is produced to a high standard. Some great staff at BBC Scotland putting things together who work under a great deal of pressure because the corporation itself is, is getting smaller and smaller. You're having to do more with less, and there's a lot of talented people in there. How did your involvement with Match of the Day come about then? I basically niggled them. You know, basically I was BBC Scotland's number one at the time, uh, and I thought, you know what, why not try? Um, so a guy called Andrew Clement, who's head of Match of the Day, in terms of commentators, I went down to meet him, I had a chat with him, and, you know, eventually on a final day of a season where they needed 10 commentators, I got a chance. And over a space of four or five seasons, I was getting three, four or five games. Just never quite able to break into that sort of every week, every second week thing. And then around about 2010, they decided that the staff commentators had to do more than one game a weekend. Yeah. And so the need for seven, eight, nine commentators in a weekend became four, five, six. And I was too far down the pecking order. And that's been it since then. Have, have you never had another opportunity maybe try your work down there since that time? They know I'm here. Um, I, I send them an email on a regular basis just to say if you ever need cover, if you ever need an opportunity. But I think that's come and gone, I have to be honest. I loved it. It was fantastic. Go to clubs. You know, I've worked at Newcastle, Middlesbrough, Wigan, Man City. Before they were famous, you could argue I did a Man City-Sheffield United game, which was nil-nil. It was turgid. It was horrible. You know, now I laugh when I look at Man City and how they are now. I wouldn't get a sniff of going to a Man City game but it just shows you how football changes but I did love doing match of the day I think that probably brings us on to the next question so I think we're all agreed that the, you know, the Premier League in England is simply a, a completely different level to ourselves and any comparisons of the product itself are possibly redundant but I'd be interested to know whether that extends to the media experience so you know the experiences you've had working with BBC firstly sort of commentating on the Scottish games and then when you've been covering games down south has there been a sort of difference that you've encountered? There's a slight cultural difference the media access I think is much better in England and the reason I say that is they just seem to be set up and some clubs see broadcasters as a nuisance Others see them as an opportunity. And all the clubs that I've worked with down in England, I mean, bar none, have always been so helpful, so welcoming, so receptive. Part of that, though, is because Sky call the shots so much down there. You're almost piggybacking off of them. You know, I mean, I watched floor managers, you know, with the Sky badges, they go where they want, they've got access where they want, they don't seem to get hassled. Uh, so money definitely talks down there. The stadiums tend to be bigger with the exception probably of Rangers and Celtic. They tend to be newer, the facilities do tend to be a bit better. Scotland are catching up on that. Uh, you know, Rangers and Celtic have their media rooms, their press areas, and some of the clubs in Scotland have been a bit slow to catch up with that, and some of them don't have them. You know, it's still, you're not looking for a life of luxury, but if you're getting to a game around a half before, you'd like to sit somewhere quiet and have a cup of coffee or something. You're, you're not asking for great treatment. I mean. I'd go and work at Newcastle every week for the food alone. Yeah. You know, it, it was just a wonderful place. They're going so friendly, so well organised. Um, if, if you go down to places, you know, I mean, a lot of the interviews you'll see, you know, the BBC guys do are either outside or in a tiny, cramped little room. You go down to some of the stadiums in England and they've got a room for the BBC, a room for ITV, a room for Sky, a room for BT. Some of it is a different level. 
So do you think then the, the flip side of you know getting that money in for Sky is that you have little control on maybe what your club's doing on a day to day basis in terms of you know where you send your staff out, where you're doing, you've got to sometimes maybe run things past you know the people that are responsible for you getting these sort of large amounts of cash in. Do you think that's a, a sort of help then to some clubs in Scotland in terms of how they can run their business? It depends what Scotland's clubs do with the money. I mean, I don't think. You can't compare Scotland with England. I mean, it's an obscene amount of money in England, without any doubt. It's absolutely obscene. And Scotland, you could say, is hard done by. But if Scotland's financial deal doubled, for example, what would they do with it? If all they're going to do is double the players' wages, then you can say, well, what's the point? If you're going to improve facilities for fans, if you're going to try and make access to grounds better, then, yeah, I'd be all for them getting more money. Um, I do think it's been sold a little bit on the cheap but then again you can only sell if somebody's willing to buy at a certain price perfect well I think that probably leads us into you know the main crux of what we want to cover today in terms of you know the representation of your game currently as it stands so you view Scottish football from a pretty unique perspective as someone who not only covers the national game for the national broadcaster but also as someone who covers a range of other sports some at the complete opposite end of the spectrum in terms of coverage and media attention. Are there similar experiences as a broadcaster or does the focus on football make it a completely different breed? Football is unique, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I do bowls. If I want to speak to one of the bowlers at a tournament I'm working at, I'll walk up to them and say, how are you doing? Yeah. You know, you can't get near players pretty much. Now, you used to be able to, you used to be able to walk, you know, just about anywhere. That, those days are gone. Rugby's a bit in between, you know, they've got their media liaison and things like that, so it's a bit more on the, the professional side. My concern is that also with the growth of club media, there's a restriction, seems to be more of a restriction for the press, the written press, and for the broadcast media, because the club wants stories, the club wants to keep certain things inside you know, so they can encourage their own subscription bases and things like that. That makes it harder for the journalists. I mean, journalists would tell you, when I started, you know, they had phone numbers of lots of players, they just phone up, have a word, no problem. Now, technically, everything's got to go through the club, and if it doesn't go through the club, you'll get into trouble. When I used to first start doing interviews with managers like Alex Miller, Joe Jordan, you just sit down and have a chat, you know. Nowadays, there's usually a media person standing next to the manager in case they're saying something. I've seen it down in England where they've got a recorder, so they record everything, just in case something's taken out of context when you edit it later. It starts to get to the touch of paranoia, but you only need one or two bad stories or to be misquoted, and you can understand why guys would be like that. Yeah, perfectly. I mean, we've, we've even found that, even starting off this year, you know, to be fair to both Hearts and Tibbs, they, they do try to be as helpful as they can, but I think there is a, a natural reluctance to maybe letting the players have too free a speech in case, especially when they're, you know, chasing leagues, chasing cups, they're maybe just not wanting them to say something which could be coaxed out of supporters like ourselves that maybe, you know, normal guys working within the right uh, broadcasters maybe wouldn't coax out of them. So I can, I can understand where you're coming there in terms of it must be frustrating on your end but also there is an acceptance of why the clubs probably feel the need to, to maybe shield their players. I can understand the clubs shielding their players. I'm not convinced that they properly media train their players. Mm. You can media train someone to tell you nothing, but that's not the point. You've got to be able to say something, You've, you know, if you're going to be asked in an interview, but there's ways of doing it without necessarily being critical of a referee, without being critical of your opponents. You want to, if you're being asked about a particular goal you scored or a tackle, try not to be bland, you know, describe it, say how you actually felt about it. So I think there could be a lot more constructive media training. I mean, I've never gone into an interview trying to trip anybody up or to try and get a story out of them. Nowadays, because I've been in the business a while, and know quite a lot of the guys. If there's something controversial, say, look, I'm going to ask you about such and such. If you want to walk away, you want to tell me to get lost, that's fine. But you know I've got to ask it. Um, and then their reaction, it's entirely up to them. As I say, if a managers walk away from me, I've been berated after interviews. But managers aren't daft. They've got to accept they're going to be asked certain questions. A sort of recent good example of someone who will sort of speak their mind without, I would imagine, uh, you know, opening it up 
in forms of criticising his own team or others would be Jason Cummins, who when he's been asked to sort of describe maybe scoring a goal or just you know a specific moment in the game, has tended to not look like he was exactly in, engaging his head too much before coming up with a long his answer. Do you subscribe to the way that he would sort of deal with an interview over maybe say the more generic, well, it was a tough game, it was a game of two halves, you know, the usual sort of... Uh, generic sort of answers that you may get off of most footballers these days? I like players to be honest and I think if you can recognise that somebody is being honest with you, if they say something that might be slightly controversial, I don't think they deserve to be jumped all over for it. You know, we kind of, as supporters, as broadcasters, don't want people, as you say, Scott, to just give you the, the trite stuff. But if somebody comes out with something that's slightly you know, interesting or colourful, there seems to be you know, a weird, strange reaction to that. I wish people could be honest. They do seem to want a bit of both at times. There we does do. seems to be a sort of rules and regulations, but at the same time you want there to be emotion, but it's hard to get a, a fine balance between the two, uh, which I do think that someone like Cummins does offer in his interviews, but for some reason it has been has been jumped on by some, and, you know, it's, it's good to get a sort of opinion from someone who does work within the game as to, you know, what would yourself or someone who you work with, what would they think uh, when he's given out those answers? Would you be thinking, it's not really what I'm looking for? Or I think as long as you're not being indiscreet, yeah. then that's fine, I'll take whatever answers. I'd, ra- I'd rather somebody did that than somebody be, be boring. Yeah. I, th- I think, and that's where the media training perhaps has to come in, is to say, look, you can give an opinion, but be careful you don't cross certain boundaries. Scotland's a small pond. You know, Jason Cummings, you know, for example, if, if he'd wanted to say something about the way Falkirk had played, if he'd felt he'd been a bit hard done by in the treatment. You know, you can say, well, I'll tell you what, it was a physical game, I've got a couple of dunks, and people know what he means. He doesn't have to come out and say, well, I'll tell you what, it was the big number four. You know, you don't have to name names in those things, but you can be a little bit, a bit more expansive. And I like that from players. As I say, I've never gone into an interview to stitch anybody up. If somebody tells you before an interview, do not ask me such and such, then you've got a problem because that might be what you're going to ask and you have to ask them and therefore I would clear that up before I went on air or then have the ability to say you know this person has refused to speak about such and such I'd say look I'll ask you the question walk away that's much better for me but I can't be seen not to ask it I was once Jim Jeffries was being linked with the Aberdeen job and he came up to do an interview for Sports Sound and he says don't mention Aberdeen <laughs> so we went on we did the interview and I said, finally, Jim, I said, Aberdeen. And he glared at me. And I went, Hearts, play them next week. What's your thoughts, Jim? And of course, <laughs> he just had to laugh. So he, sometimes you could get away with it. Um, and then he just, he actually mentioned the, the speculation. So there's different ways to ask questions. Do you feel that your jobs became much more difficult since you first started in terms of the characters within the game that you now deal with? Do you feel that it's, it's tougher to get, you know, what you would class as a even a sort of decent interview out of someone because everyone's so media trained and apparently media savvy. Do you think that that's taken a little bit of the sort of fun and excitement out of your out of your interviews after you've commented on matches? I don't think it's taken the fun and excitement out of it that way. Where I think the problem is, when I first started, you'd go down for an interview, you'd hang around, you'd speak to a lot of the players, you know, just casually. Mm. Now the way a lot of clubs are set up, you barely see the players. And for the sort of first 10, 12 years of my career, I was used to milling around at Easter Road. You go pitch side, you go pitch side at Timecast, and you get to know guys. That's why a lot of these guys have now come through and are managers or coaches, and, and that's been great. But it's harder and harder to actually get near these players now, just the way you're kept back. Uh, there's more media restrictions, so you don't actually develop that same relationship with players. I've never wanted to be really close to players, but if players, all I've wanted to know is, that's the BBC guy. So if I ask them something, you know, they know who you are, they know you're not going to stitch them up. Sometimes all you want to be is pitch side to ask a guy if he's a new signing, how do you pronounce your name, mate? You know, and it gets harder and harder to actually get near, you know. The worst thing you can do, if, for example, if you want to find out how to pronounce a name is ask the manager, because they've not got a clue. Yeah. You know, oh, it's the big guy, or we call him, you know. Such and such, you know, so you, you want to speak to the players and sometimes, I mean, 
I've not done so many European trips lately, but they used to be great. You used to get a chance to speak to players hanging around the airports and stuff, and you got to know them, and you'd get a few little nuggets and stuff like that. It's great little bits of research. So, But there is much more media prevention, there's no doubt about that. With that in mind, do you then feel that, you know, there is certainly, especially from, uh, you know, areas out with the Glasgow, there does seem to be a, a so-called West Coast bias towards, you know, covering Rangers and Celtic as they are the two biggest clubs in the country. Do you feel that the clubs out with them could maybe try and help things along for themselves by maybe offering more access than those two clubs can and maybe try and bring, you know, the BBC, BT in a little bit more, maybe give them a little bit more access, maybe see if they can get, a, you know, a few more extra inches, a bit more time on the radio. Do you think that would be a benefit to some of those clubs? I think some of these clubs have tried. Um, I don't know if I subscribe to West Coast bias in the way a lot of people in Edinburgh and Dundee and Aberdeen do. I think it's just sheer size. You've only got to look when Rangers or Celtic are playing at home, the coaches leaving the Highlands and Islands, Aberdeen, Inverness, Dundee, Edinburgh and the surrounding areas to know how big Rangers and Celtic are. And I think that's unfortunate, but that's where the media live and breathe. It is supply and demand, it, basically. I mean, it, it is. It works the same down south, it works the same in Spain and Italy. It's just the way it works. I don't think there's an excuse then for the other clubs not to be covered properly. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've been frustrated once or twice in my career where I've got to ground, I've got a story, you deliver it, and say, oh, we don't have time for that, we're concentrating on this, and you think, well, if that were Rangers and Celtic could drop in their goalkeeper or their centre forward, that would be big news. But because it's not Rangers and Celtic and it might only be Dundee United, it might not be treated, you know, in the papers and radio and TV as such a big story. It's supply and demand, as you say. I mean, I'm sure Southampton feel they don't get the right level of respect that they should in the national press down in England, for example, or Leicester or Burnley. And that's where it's sometimes the job of the more local media um, to try and pick that up and run with that. Now, do you feel that football's lost touch with its audience in any way that less glamorous sports like Bowls or Shinty have been able to retain? I think they're two different things. I think you can't really compare them. Um, Bowls is a great sport to be involved in, a great sport to play, but Bowls will never attract crowds of 20, 30, 40,000. Same with Shinty. So what I think these sports have got to do is work hard to get the media coverage that they feel they deserve but they're on a different planet compared to football. Football is the number one sport here. I think it will be for a long time. And I think, but there's room for other sports to be covered. I'd like to see more of these other sports on television. I think we're seeing a lot of these sports deciding, well, we'll televise stuff ourselves. You can now get the internet. Um, you've now got, you know, you can cast to your television. So there's, there's an audience opening up for these sports that perhaps I think, for example, the BBC linked up with the British Basketball Association and showed their final online. Now, that's great because that delivers a better audience than they would have got on their own, and I'd like to see the BBC do a bit more of that, linking up with organisations and sharing coverage. And if it's just streaming and publicising it that way, because we all know money's tight, then, then all the better. Now, being a commentator, I'm sure you get asked lots of questions with regards to how you view the commentary side of a game is covered. Yeah. But... Do you ever feel like you've got quite a lot to say in terms of, you know, other aspects of the media? So even things such to do with, you know, how we handle, you know, the halftime parts of the games, whether we're maybe, you know, representing teams or not. The kind of example I've got is Sky in particular, I feel, do a very poor job of covering Scottish football. So the title credits, it's very generic, it's bagpipes, it's short red tin music, you know, it's people just shouting the names of the clubs and then you go on to maybe like the five minutes that they do cover prior to a game kicking off. For example, Hearts and Hibs, it's stock footage in Edinburgh Castle, and it just seems to be the same stuff regurgitated season by season. As a commentator, do you ever find yourself watching stuff like that and thinking that could be handled so much better? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to pick on any one broadcaster, but you watch certain things and sometimes you go, wow, that's great. You know, great idea for a piece. It, it, it's hard to be creative all the time. I would rather people stuck to the basics and did them really well. If I was going to have only five minutes as a lead up into a game, I'd rather get the hard news, I'd rather get 
you know, the thoughts of the pundits than some fluffy montage of things floating around. I like to see old footage, old goals. You know, that, that's the thing that, that excites me. You've got to be very careful when you're being creative. A couple of years ago, BBC Scotland did a Mad Men thing with Ali McCoy. Yeah, I remember. That. Which, if you take it as a piece, yeah. it was beautifully put together. It was in context, but boy, did people not like it. <laughs> and that was somebody who made a really good piece of television, um, which I thought was quite good. I think we take things a bit too personally, and I, I would like to see that stop. Just we get a little bit prickly, you know. People in the, all walks of life, you know, if, if we're getting criticised, you know, if I'd been a Rangers fan, I would have laughed at that and said, "Oh, fair enough," you know. Don't agree with it, but I wouldn't have been, you know, DBBC, you know, this is a disgrace kind of thing. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of a few of those letters in my time, but I, I think if you if you go even with skies, you know, the bagpipes. Is that coming from production down south? Is it any different to coming on with a Spanish football with a Spanish guitar in the background and the Spanish flag? So that might just be how they, they brand something. It does seem to be, I mean, personally speaking, I watch those title credits and I do think that there's a lack of thought put towards it. Whereas, and again, it's not that you're wanting to compare it to the English game, but you know, you feel like there's four or five million put on the title credits alone, everything's CGI. They've got music from very relevant artists and, you know, everything. What I like about what sports scene have done now is they've went sort of back to the basics. They're now showing you, you know, footage for older games, using music that's familiar at least to the audience or at least a good portion of the audience. I just feel that Sky could possibly learn from what BBC and even Alba are doing. Alba, I think, do really good stuff with their halftime pieces. Alba's halftime stuff's really good. Yeah. I like sports scene going back to more traditional music. It's interesting, in any walk of life, if you come in and, and you do a job and you're looking after something, one of the things you'll tend to do is change something because you've got to make an impact on it. I think one of the secrets of match of the day is they've left it alone. I can then say I'm frustrated by that because I'm so far down on the commentator list, but they've been very loyal to the guys that are there. They don't constantly change it. When you've got something that works, leave it alone if it's not broken. Keep it modernised. In, in terms of, you know, Match of the Day with that wonderful CGI graphic, you know, with the different people merged in from various eras, but they still had the offside tune. Yeah. You know, d don't abandon stuff. It's interesting, I mean, you talk about, um, you know, the Sky intro or, or something like that. I don't have a problem with teams of broadcasters. You know, if that's the Scottish thing, you know, doing that, that that's just one of these things that they do. But... I would like to see, from all broadcasters, a little bit higher profile. I'd like to see, and we might come on to this later, so many crucial Scottish games are scheduled against big English games, yeah. which is infuriating, uh, and then not given the time to build up. And that's where I think some of our games treated as second class. In terms of the scheduling of the games, now, I can only talk for myself now. I know that if there's a, a Dundee Hamilton game on, and if, if it's say West Brom and Leicester, I know which game I'll watch. I'll always watch the Scottish game because I feel that I've got more attachment to even those players playing in the Scottish leagues. They'll tend to have players playing that have maybe either played for Hearts or played for Hibs or whatever. And I've watched, like you say, a lot of turgid games that have involved a lot of teams down south and you can find yourself spending a lot of Sundays watching stuff like that. How do you view that? Do you think that there maybe needs to be a little bit more effort made on behalf of the fans to maybe try and engage themselves with the sport up here? Or I, See, I think it's quite interesting. I'm with you. If I'm going to watch a game of football, I want to care about it. A lot's made of the Spanish league and how wonderful that is. And I'll watch it occasionally, but it doesn't actually hold any emotional tie for me. At the weekend, you had Man United played Arsenal. I watched Aloha Forfa. It meant something. There was people I knew in the game. There was players I knew... To me, to watch football, you've got to care about it, uh, and that's my main thing. The problem with it, there's too much on the television. There's far too much on the telly. I mean, if you take, you know, we're a 12-team Premier League, one game should be televised in a weekend, one out of six. Then go to one game in the Championship, but to take two or sometimes three, it's just taking the mickey. We're not big enough for that. And they talk about the television deal. I'd be selling the television deal saying one live game a weekend from the Premier League, 
one live game from the championship if you don't like that well that's tough that's what we're doing let's get football back to being largely at three o'clock i think our season tickets aren't selling for two reasons one you don't know when the games are going to be and two chances are you're going to be able to get a ticket anyway because you know yourself Hibs play hearts it's always likely to be live on telly you're looking at a friday you're looking at a sunday that doesn't fit for a lot of people so if you're then know that a couple of these derbies are going to be three o'clock on a saturday great you might shift more season tickets but i can understand the english game if you've got you know 11 games two or three of them being shown but we've only got six one one's enough two occasionally but i think one's enough i think this season's probably highlighted that case more than any other due to the fact that hearts and hibs and rangers have found themselves out of the top league yeah you would probably definitely say you know a requirement for one game per week eh, to be shown fair enough if you get to the business end of the season and two or three you know parts of the league are still being decided then that's fine maybe try and see if you can you know uh, get a, get an extra deal uh, mm-hmm. so to speak towards the end of the year but yeah I would definitely agree with that uh, now I think it's generally felt that football and TV has stuck to a pretty straight formula for a number of years now the BBC have shown their willingness to embrace new ideas on radio with the implementation of open all mics is there room for a similar development in TV coverage or is it simply the case that the formula exists for a reason Open all mics has existed in some forms on television. That's your bounce round the grounds on the, the sports scene results. That's your Soccer Saturday. Soccer Saturday is basically radio on television. Um, and people greet Soccer Saturday with some degree of innovation. It's not really. It's basically what we've always had on the radio, but you get actually a chance to see people. Um, I think BBC, the open all mics... I'd change it in some ways, and I've told the producer that. I'd sharpen it slightly in different ways. I think it works largely because they've got Richard Gordon presenting it, who is just so good at keeping right across things and and keeping it right. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more emphasis on football and less on the trying to get laughs. And I've told that to the producer. So there's a pressure there because he's Soccer Saturday and because they have that entertainment element to their show. But in fact, they've got two or three hours to build to then dis- get the entertainment side out of the way to then discuss the football whereas open all mics maybe don't have that lengthy time prior and they're trying to fit everything into that hour and a half or two hours where they're covering the games I might be slightly old fashioned but between three and quarter to five I want to know the football yeah. that, that's the main thing I was actually on open all mics a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was quite actually well football focused and I think when, it's, when there's a lot happening the format works as a commentator, I'd rather cover a game start to finish all the way through. And Radio Scotland, with the two frequencies, are able to offer that. I think it's great. It gives people a choice. Television, I mean, NBC in America are bouncing around an idea of a sort of red zone for English Premiership football where they're trying to you know, go from game to game. That's a little bit different because it's out with the, the primary market and, you, you know, you're not stopping fans from going. It, it's, it's possibly a bit like Soccer Saturday, but with the actual visual action. I'd just like to see, you know, good build-up, good pundits who are prepared to speak their mind and tell you what, what you think, and good coverage, you know, good camera work. One of the things I didn't realise when I first started in television is the specialist positions of some of the camera people. And then you actually get to realise the skills that these people have. Um, the match directors are incredible. You know, sometimes they're up to 20 cameras and they're all trying to cut it. It's a harder job than it looks. Sometimes it's dead easy just sitting there talking about it. Um, so, I mean, you can only innovate so much. I mean, Sky tried it for a while with 3D football. Didn't really work. Player cam doesn't really work does it because you want to see the overview of the game you even um, allowed the fans to commentate for a while as well which I think I tried maybe twice yeah. and it was taught in Arsenal but maybe not the right game to be picking for that sort of thing but it was literally just two guys arguing with each other for a minute so I thought I could go to the pub and hear that <laughs> yeah I mean credit to them for trying yeah. I mean that's the thing why not try these things because something might work and then you might never live without it I mean remember years ago somebody came up with the idea of keeping the scoreline on all the time yeah. you know and now you, if you ever come into a game and the scoreline's not on the telly you're, on. 
you know, so there's certain things you now take for granted. So no, I'm all for trying stuff and to see if it works. Don't have a problem with that. So let's say someone was to walk up to you next week and say, right, Paul, we want you to schedule when you tough sports you on, how you would format the show and how long you would sort of have, say, highlights packages and, you know, time to talk about the game. What would be an ideal sort of episode of sports scene for you now? You'd have to go back a step and say that you only had one live game, so you had five three o'clock games. And if you had five three o'clock games, cameras at two of them, uh, in fact all five, OB's at two of them, and then half ten on a Saturday night. Just as they do in match of the day, we should be able to do up here. I'd love to see that back on a Saturday night. Don't want to get in trouble with the BBC. I know how they work, I know why they work, you know, the way they do. But I think a lot of football fans, I talk as a fan here, I'd like to see Scottish football on half ten on a Saturday night. And then you used to get the best two English games to round it out. And that was great. I'd like to see it not being so rushed. I think match of the day, you could actually add on another half hour to match of the day. Sometimes I think the analysis is far too quick. And it's almost thrown away. I'd put match of the day to two hours. You know, if you've got six or seven games, why not? You know, you're showing 10, 12 minutes of each game and then actually talk about it beyond the the bland, he'll be disappointed with that. Yeah. You, you know, there's there's a lot of good guys there who could tell you. Television, what's important for a TV analyst is tell me something that I've not seen. Yeah. Explain something to me that I've not seen. That, that to me, is the key. Or explain a contentious decision but not from just a fan's perspective. Look at it from from the other angle. I, that's what I'd like to see, being honest. It might happen sometime, who knows? And an interesting element that seems to have been highlighted this season more than any other has been the use of current footballers on sports scene for the highlights package, and then how that's maybe led to a, a subconscious maybe bias towards certain teams or players within the team. Now, a prime example would be Stephen Thompson at St Mirren. Now, at the start of the season, Stephen Thompson was in the back, you know, backroom staff, along with Jim Goodwin, along with Gary Teal, and during those first few months, you know, Tommy Craig was open to a lot of criticism in terms of how he had the team set up to play. Now, there does seem to have been a shift towards, you know, how people are now commenting on St Mirren due to the fact that it's now characters such as Stephen Thompson and Jim Goodwin that are heavily involved in the decision making. Do you see that from where you are? In terms of, you know, maybe that, again, I don't think it's people, you know, making it out to be like that but I think there might be a subconscious where you know you're now working with these people maybe there's you know uh, as I've said a subconscious need to maybe not criticise them as much as the, the previous incumbent of the hot seat it's interesting I think sports scene you're caught between trying to be relevant and, and trying to be very analytical and critical I think a lot of these guys that we've had on on sports scene will, will talk pretty much you know what they're trying to say they're not trying to hide from decisions and sometimes you admire them for coming on after their team's been thumped I mean the easiest thing in the world to do is pick up the phone and go don't fancy it tonight because I know I'm going to get a hard time I think again if it's done honestly then that's fine you can't hide if somebody's been beaten 3-0 they know they've played badly they know the team's played badly and you've got to basically challenge that if you don't you're not doing your job as a broadcaster, they might try and avoid answering. Do they get an easier ride? Possibly, but I think that applies right across the board. Yeah. I mean, if you take somebody like Walter Smith, Walter Smith was exceptionally media savvy. So in the good times, you're dealing with people, you're giving them stories, you make yourself accessible, because in the bad times, you've got a bit of credit in the bank. Now, that that's human nature, and you're not going to do anything about that and that's why you do some managers appear to get an easier ride because they are more accessible they are you know better to deal with they don't make your life you know difficult so it's it's human nature creeps in that somebody will get the benefit of the doubt a little bit longer and I think that's that's not unique to football I mean you can take it in any of your work situations if you're dealing with people on projects and people are great and they're helpful when they've got a problem, you think, oh, normally I'd fire off an email and say this guy's hopeless, but I'll give him benefit of the doubt this time. It just happens that way. 
So, <clears throat> there has been a lot of talk with regards to our most recent sponsorship deal with Ladbrokes, and you know, again, there has been now a highlighting of the money that is being, you know, given out, you know, through the BBC onto the Scottish clubs compared to maybe what's being spent down south and how that's maybe being quite disproportionate. Uh, now, do you think that the people in charge of the Scottish game are getting the best deal possible? Do you think that there's a lot of you know stumbling blocks and they are trying their best, or do you think they're just taking what they can, and maybe it's they who actually lack the belief in our game? One of the things that was interesting about the Ladbrokes deal was the quote that said, you know, we spoke to hundreds of companies. That alarms me. Yeah. If you've spoken to hundreds of companies, how did you only get one to say yes? So that alarms me in itself. We live in a difficult financial time. So the sponsors aren't there for the wide range of sports. So I think you've got to accept some years will be good and some years will be bad. We shouldn't be without a sponsor of some sort. We must have enough cash, enough credit to say this is a product worth sponsoring. But there is a bad image about Scottish football at the moment. Um, Celtic Inverness being played at quarter past 12 on a Sunday. That's, that's insane. And that just shows a disregard for the game. The fact that, you know, the fixtures came out after the split. Celtic should have played Aberdeen right away because that was the fixture that meant something. Yeah. No, we're going to put it safe, we're going to put it down here. We're not selling our game even when we've got the opportunity to do it. Are we playing it too safe? I don't know. But I would think... I mean, credit to Landbooks for coming in. They've offered the money... If Ladbrokes could have afforded to give us four million, but Scottish football were going to sign for two, you're going to offer them two. Yeah. That that makes perfect sense from their point of view. And if there's not 10, 12 companies bidding for it, then you're going to your price is going to be low. I think it's the job of the people at the SPFL and the SFA now to go out and sell in probably a year's time the benefit that Ladbrokes are getting for name sponsorship, as the Clydesdale Bank benefited it and show to people why it's worth. 3 million, 4 million, 5 million. That's their job. If they don't do it, they should be moved on. I, I do feel that, you know, they will try and take credit whenever they can, such as with the Scottish Cup final. So they seemed quite happy to pat themselves on the back when free tickets were being offered and that. But I think the, you know, the thing you've got to always keep in the back of your mind is if that had been a Celtic Hibs final, there would never have been a free ticket on show. And it's, it's just, you know, their, their terminology or their statements when there was the issue with the Rangers Harps fixture towards the end of the season and you know Neil Doncaster's coming out and he's saying well we've really got to thank Sky for allowing us to you're just thinking that's just the wrong way of conveying that message to the supporters you know after telling them one day it was going to be this day and I know a few Harps fans who changed to the Sunday and then were trying to change back and I actually know Hibs fans who haven't been to Pataudry for a Saturday fixture and they're people who follow Hibs home and away every season they haven't been to Saturday the tawdry fixture in about five or six years. Yeah, because the same fixtures keep getting picked, and this is part of the problem. If you've got two or three games being picked for live television, Aberdeen Hibs is always a great game. I'll stick that on the telly. I mean, you can look at it most weeks. I mean, every Hearts Rangers fixture, every Hearts Celtic fixture, every Hearts Hibs fixture, you know is going to be picked up for live TV, yeah. and everything's getting moved around, and that's where it creates chaos. If guys want to go to the football at three o'clock on a Saturday, which is the traditional time. They don't mind going occasionally on a Sunday or occasionally on a Friday night, but they don't want to be chased. You know, you want you know at least 25 year games to be at that three o'clock slot. I think Celtic fans in particular have maybe bore the brunt of that in recent seasons with the Europa Week. I mean, if you take that into account along with the you know the change in the schedules of TV games, they, they, they might literally have maybe two or three Saturday three o'clock kickoffs in the whole season. Yet they're still giving it the hard sell in terms of trying to get fans in to buy season tickets when you know fans know it's a 60,000 seater stadium and they know that for the games against the likes of St Johnston and Partick it's going to be quite you know easy to just walk in there and just pay it to the gate on that Saturday if the game does go ahead on that day. See that's a really good point, some people I think think that Celtic don't have to work too hard, I actually think Celtic market their stuff really well. Um, they're doing a wonderful project around Celtic Park at the moment with the Legends banners and things like that. I think Celtic are quite smart. I think Rangers previously were quite smart as well. Um, you've only got to look, and I think this is where Scottish, the individual clubs, Hibs 
launched their new kit, looks great, they know how to do a kit launch now, Dundee United, great season ticket ideas. So we're starting to see the growth of much better marketing from individual clubs, and I think that's great. You know, if you're going through Leith or Gorgie, you know, there should be a big billboard somewhere, you know, we are hearts, we are hibs, you know, get that local that local feel, but you've got to grow it up from there. Um, rather than expect the SFA or the SPFL to do it all for you. I think the clubs have got a responsibility to do it themselves. I think you're right, especially with the comment about Celtic. I know that they came in for a lot of flack about the fact that you know they wrote that letter into the SFA on the back of the Meekins handball incident, but they're there for their customers. If some of their customers are asking a question, why wouldn't you be taking that question on? That You'd do that in any line of business, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> The thing is, you're there to look after your own constituents, yeah. if you like. So, why not? I mean, some people might have seen it as mischief-making, but again, I think we take certain things too seriously. I mean, the SFPFL looked at it and went, scrunch it up, throw it out. <laughs> but Celtic have done their job, you know, for their yeah. fans. Probably knowing full well what would happen as well. Exactly. They're not daft. I yeah. mean, a lot of these clubs are not daft. A lot of appeals will not work. But sometimes you've got to play to your own market. And I don't have a problem with that. I think we overreact and we take the bait for too many things. But I suppose that's why we love the game. There's so much discussion and, well, they did that and they said that. I mean, the Josh Meekings thing, when I first saw it, I wasn't 100% sure. Um, And I can understand how it was missed because the referee was partly blocked and the assistant was partly blocked. And that's a big big moment in a game and I can understand that Celtic are frustrated at that I don't think these things necessarily even themselves out I think that doesn't work either it's just unfortunate human beings, we are going to make mistakes, now do you then say give one challenge to each manager, because if that's challenged as it is in the NFL or in baseball, then a penalty is given We've got the technology. I always felt sorry for the Republic of Ireland when they got done with France with a handball, you know, to, to send France through to the World Cup. Now, why should it be that you, me, and everybody watching knows that the goal's been illegally scored within seconds, yeah. but the one guy who can make the decision doesn't know? We've got to find a way to get technology, not to break everything down. Not every decision. Not every you know, decision. Yeah. No, definitely not. But is it a goal? Is it not? Is it a penalty? Is it not? I mean, I, you mentioned it earlier, I do rugby union. And one of the things that is slightly frustrating is when a try is given, a lot of the referees, rather than having the courage or the convictions to give the try, simply make the sign of the TV. And you almost lose something because you've then got to watch rerun after rerun after rerun. And even then, sometimes they don't get it right. But at least. 99 times at 100 you're then getting the correct decision and as I say it sometimes takes two replays I mean you saw how quickly Sky got that replay up with Josh Meekings it doesn't take a long time do you then have a fifth official who's sitting watching the telly in the replays or do you give it to the fourth official I don't know but hey we're clever as people we put a man on the moon a few years ago I think we can work out a Scottish football, and uh, well, in fact, a worldwide football replay system. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that covers probably most of the stuff to do with terms of sort of like Scottish football. But I think the last question with regards to media would be involving social media. So you are someone who does use, uh, you know, you're quite a frequent sort of Twitter user. You've been very thank- uh, sort of generous in giving us your sort of backing in terms of the show as well. Now. <sighs> What are the, the sort of pros and uh, sort of cons in terms of you know social media and its use within the game? When I first started, there was no such thing as social media. When I became BBC's main commentator, it wasn't really that much, but it was starting to develop mainly through forums and things yeah. like that. And a couple of times, I'll confess, I had a look, and then you think, what am I doing? Have you ever read any comments oh. about you where you've just cringed? Well, yeah, I mean, I've read quite a few. And <laughs> basically, I, I, I had, a, had a good conversation once with Gordon Smith, former Rangers guy. Uh, he said, look, it's not worth it. Just don't yeah. don't look at it. And that's pretty much my rule now. I just don't look at it. Um, my rule is when I do a game, if 
for example, it's a big game, and I speak afterwards to Alistair Alexander, who's been a bit of a mentor for me, and Alistair says, well, you didn't actually have your best game today, you, you know, thought you let you down here, that's fine, he's been there, seen it, done it, and understands it. If somebody wants to say, that boy Mitchell's an if an idiot, he's not got a damn clue, and he's biased, that's not somebody offering an opinion. I've always said, be a fan, be a player, be a manager. If somebody disagrees with something, I'll happily talk to you and tell you why I said it, what I was thinking. Uh, but if somebody just wants to rant that you're this, you're that, I mean, I support every team in Scotland if you believe what people have written yeah. about me. Um, and it's now at the point I don't care anymore. But what's interesting, you've got to take it the other way as well, Scott, is when people praise you, you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. The, the best quote I ever heard is, praise is like perfume. Appreciate it, but don't swallow it. You know, and that, that to me is it. You know, you, you like being praised, but you know, don't let it go to your head and think you're some better person or you're better commentator than you actually are. And don't let the negative stuff get you down. I've been trolled on Twitter once, <laughs> only once. I mean, only key, I, I got forced onto Twitter when I started doing the rugby for BBC Alba because all the commentators are on Twitter. Yeah. And it's something I actually didn't understand Twitter, and I wish I had because I actually really enjoy it. It's very interesting to see what people say. Um, and there's a lot of people that just I've got a good idea about football and can write something you think didn't see it from that angle and you know we're not talking about the idiots who just go on and rant about something but there's a lot of clever stuff and if you can find the clever stuff <laughs> actually I'm a big fan of Twitter and never thought I'd say yeah. that that's good to hear so uh, you know rounding up I thought it would be good to sort of get some of your your favourite Hearts and Hibs moments in terms of you know blowing a lot of games either commentating or even just happening to take in a game now and again so we'll start with your favourite Hearts moments so has there been games that you've commented on that you've really enjoyed I think for both Hearts and Hibs the best games have been the European games just love doing Hearts and Hibs in Europe um, Hearts against Stuttgart when they nearly came back that famous night I did the game with Willie Miller that's probably the most excited Speaking I've ever been. football fans that was another good case you not listening to the fans because I'm sure did that not kick off at about half nine for German television? That, that was for German television I was worried that I wasn't going to get a bus home because Judy had gone any extra time there was a bit of me when Petrus put over the bar I was like well I'll make it into school tomorrow at least <laughs> <laughs> That was just a wonderful night yeah. um, the Hibs AK Athens game and Hibs had lost in Athens and Paco Luna has the header from eight, nine, ten yards out for a hat trick to put Hibs through. That was an amazing night and unfortunately both the Scottish teams lost on, on those occasions. But yeah, they're my favourite nights. Any, anything to do with Europe, usually under the floodlights at Tyne Castle is unbeatable. Easter Road I think is a fine stadium when it's full and the chance to go away you know, to places with these teams has always been great. That's an interesting thing, you know, with regards to atmosphere, do you think that it is true that there's maybe some grounds that do seem to contain it better than ours? I know that Hearts fans, you know, we do have quite a, we do seem to bring up the subject more than I think most do, in terms of, you know, how we perceive Tyne Castle, and there is quite a lot of, you know, positive press with regards to the stadium. Do you think that maybe a little bit of it's blown out of it proportion and in fact you know you can go to Pataudry you can go to Tannadice you can go to Easter Road and get just as good an atmosphere and it really just depends on you know how the team are getting on and how the fans are engaging with that squad of players a lot of it is I mean if you put 15,000 inside Tannadice you're going to get an atmosphere same for Pataudry if you make it full you're you're usually going to get an atmosphere I was at Hearts Queen of the South the other week and it was as flat as could be Hearts had won the title and it was just dreadful you know because folk were almost sitting having a little natter it was just you know. a waiting game it now was, and, yeah. you know, and so, so there was no famous Tyne Castle atmosphere atmosphere depends on the circumstances yeah. of the games and that that's for every every club I did I've done a bit of women's football and I did Glasgow City against Arsenal at Peter Hills Park with a thousand people and it felt magnificent they got a better crowd for the match against Paris Saint-Germain earlier this year, but they played in a big stadium that felt horrendous. Yeah. So sometimes it's just the venue. If you get the right venue at the right size, the right crowd, then, you, then the atmosphere builds upon itself. Now, you can answer this question if you want, okay. but I thought I would just try and cheek you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, has there been anyone connected with Hearts or Hibs that you found it very difficult to get a, a, an interview out of? You found that maybe quite guarded? Now, it doesn't have to be anyone current, it could be anyone going back to when you first started. I think what you tend to find is when managers are doing badly, it becomes a little bit harder. Um, Pat Fenlon I got on with, but he was never an easy interview. 
he would always speak to you. But I think it was just part of his character. So I wouldn't say it was a bad experience, it was a different experience. For example, Bobby Williamson. Your best question to Bobby was, what were your thoughts in the game today, Bobby? Because if you led with something like, Bobby, you know, you were two down at half time, the midfield hadn't performed, you know, he would rip you. Yeah. You know, so you've got to know, you know, and because that, that's the nature of, of the people. Martin O'Neill at Celtic was a very shy man and didn't really want to engage in conversation before the interview, whereas other managers will chat back and forth. They're all just that little bit different. The most terrified ever was going to interview someone was Willie Miller when Aberdeen had lost 4-2 at Easter Road and Willie was in big, big trouble as Aberdeen manager and I got sent down to interview him and the prospect terrified me. Um, I was still, you know, quite a rookie reporter and you've got Willie Miller, you know, here the one-handed cup left, you know, just superb, just, you know, a real hero, but a real reputation. And he gave just a wonderful interview. Because something, you know, so sometimes you just don't know what you're what you're going into. Joe Jordan was quite fierce, but he was also quite happy to sit and have a chat. Sometimes I remember, you know, the first few times I interviewed Joe Jordan, he was quite harsh, quite you know, Bruce in certain ways. Um, I interviewed him over the course of a year. You know, got to know him a little bit, but it wasn't till there was a big cup game and the press area was packed, and he went, to, "Oh, great! So many you can make it today. Must be a big game." <laughs> He says, nice to see some of the guys who are always here and sort of gave a nod in my direction. He said, ah, OK, you know, so it, it just depends. There's, no, there's nobody I would avoid interviewing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think, you know, in terms of sort of eras, the Roman of eras, Dean would be one where media maybe did find it quite difficult to get some stories, get some, uh, you know, cooperation out of the club. Were there any points that you felt during that time where you just felt like I really didn't want to go down there and even ask the questions because I know what answers I'm going to get? Or <laughs> did you notice any of the sort of mad antics that were, you know, uh, seemingly going on behind the scenes at the time? Hearts became a very secretive club very quickly. Uh, I mean, I had great relationships with Hearts and Hibs. I've been doing them since, you know, since 91. You could get places, you know, you'd walk down the, the tunnel and stuff like that. All of that stopped. Everything became much more difficult. It was much more secretive. And it just made a worse atmosphere. Now, I mean, I would tend to only interview after a game. I felt sorry for the journalists that had to deal with these clubs every day um, because they were beating their head off a brick wall. Uh, I mean, I'm on record as saying I didn't want Roman off in at Hearts in the first place. To those who say he saved the club, somebody would have saved the club. That's my belief now. We could debate that for hours yeah. quite happily. I, I just never trusted his motives, never trusted why he was there. And there was just, you know, it, it took what was a really good club. And you could say, you can point to the success, but look at what it did. You know, I mean, you could... Drive it. You could go and buy a car and drive it 110 miles an hour and have a fabulous time. But in two years' time, when you're taking it to the scrap heap, because you've ruined it. And that that was Hearts. You ruined Hearts. Um, I love what the foundation have done. I love what Anne Budge has done. And it's getting it back to the kind of club that it should be. A perception, maybe rightly or wrongly, was that the media seemed to revel when things started to go awry at the club during that spell in the later years. Now. When, you know, yourself or, you know, colleagues within the media were not actually, you know, putting stuff on print or talking about it, what were the conversations like, you know, just amongst colleagues without, you know, being on the radio, being on the TV or, you know, having to print something? Well, it brings it back to preface this. I spoke about managers, you know, putting money in the bank so when they have a bad time, you know, they don't get such a hard time. Hearts were the opposite. Because they gave such a hard time, the second that things went wrong, hey, feeding frenzy, because they got what, you know, it came home to roost. I mean, what hit the media, I'm not convinced. I mean, we knew stuff was going wrong. We knew there was problems. I mean, you know, faxing the team, faxing substitutions, and, you know, eventually all of these things got out. But you felt sorry for guys like Stevie Frail. You know, really good football guy, and you know you're working under such circumstances. You look at players who are having their careers affected because of this. And you know, and Hartley had to leave. You know, Presley had to leave. You know, guys who would have stayed at Hearts, you reckon, you know, quite happily. So you knew that stuff was all going on in the background, some of it. But you can't report unless you can back it up. And 
you know, bit the, the teachers, you know, um, Mr. Romanoff. So you, you had to be very careful. But I think once it started to unravel, the media went in with both feet. And I don't think it was anti hearts. It was just that's how, they, you know, that's how they'd been treated. And it would be the same at any club. And I think sometimes football fans forget this. It's You're not picking on individual clubs. That's just what would happen, no matter who it was. And, you know, hearts were on the wrong end of it. Now, there has been some recent speculation that Hearts will eventually have to leave Tynecastle, even if it's just for a season or two, just to allow the redevelopment of the old main stand. Are you someone who believes that a ground share with Hibs could work? I mean, it could work, yeah. There's, there's no doubt about it. I've been in Milan, you know, AC and Inter have made it work, although it's a municipal stadium, and it's actually a bit of a dump. Um, it's not particularly great. Could it work? Yes. Would it happen? No. I think clubs are now smart enough to be building stadiums with facilities that can be used, you know, all the time, be it function suites, be it, you know, conference suites and availability. I think that's how you've got to make the use of your ground, have it as a venue, um, not just for football. And I think, I don't, I don't see Hearts and Hibs ever sharing a ground. I think the city's big enough for two grounds of 20,000. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I want to see Hearts stay at Tynecastle. That's their home. I don't see them going somewhere else. My fear about them going somewhere else is you then just get a stadium that looks like everybody else's and there's nothing particularly innovative. You just watch games on telly and you think, no, that just looks like any other stadium. You know it's Tynecastle, you know it's Easter Road. I think identity is a key thing. Um, If Hearts have got to leave, would Hearts ground share with Hibs? Possibly. I don't see a problem with that. Um, Some people would. But if it works financially for both clubs, hey, just do it. You know, it's only going to be for a season. Murrayfield's horrible as it is a stadium to watch football and I don't think the big running track on the, the main side yeah. really spoils it. I think if you were going to do it, you would have to... They wouldn't be allowed to do what they do in the rugby and have people standing at the side. So you might just have to go with one big stand because I, I think the it's atmosphere... We work with the Braga game the very first time we played there. We, we just made sure that there was 20,000 in the East stand and yeah. it seemed to be fine. Yeah. Once we started playing AK, we were getting crowds of 30,000 and people were starting to go over to that West stand yeah. where there was the running track. That seemed to be when there was issues to do, you know, surrounding the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There seems to be sort of two trains of thought just now. There's just been some Hearts fans who would rather just go to Murrayfield for the season and play in front of 10 to 15,000 there and just deal with it, knowing, I think, that they were going back. I think the issue 10 years ago was always, well, we're going there, but there's no sort of plan for it sort of after that. Uh, so yeah, it's very good to get your sort of thoughts on that. Now, as a sort of parting gift, what would your advice be to anyone listening to this who maybe you know has intentions and maybe trying to break into the media game, uh, you know, further into their career or into their life? It's interesting. I mean, there's now much more ways of getting into the media than there was when I started. You know, you, you've got college courses and things like that. There's much more practice. Uh, I mean, I started on hospital radio. That, that was where I started doing hearts games. So there's a lot more. I think what people might not realise is it's quite a brutal business. Uh, in many cases, you're either in or you're out. There's very little in between. Um, when I started, I mean, I worked at Standard Life for 16 years and you know, became a football reporter, commentator. I'd encourage people to, to think about that yeah. route. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be full time, you know, to be the best in your field. Uh, somebody like me, I just wanted to be a commentator. I don't class myself as a journalist. I'm not a story chaser. Uh, I don't have that nature. I don't have that. I mean, I'm inquisitive, but I don't have the some of the brashness that you need to be a reporter. If that's the way you want to go in, I mean, somebody asked me recently they wanted to be a sports reporter. I said, well, why don't you go and train to be a reporter, learn how to report the news, do features and do sport, widen yourself out. The wider you are, the more chances are you're going to hit. I've widened myself out. I do rugby, I do bowls, I do shinty, and I do football because that gives me more chance to get in work. And I would encourage people to think think the same way. That's great. Well, that just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time this evening, Paul, and all the very best of luck. Absolute pleasure. Keep going with the show. It's great listening. Good fun. Cheers, Paul.